and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I'm experiencing vast levels of deja vu. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, it's like March again. There I was, getting optimistic about upcoming concerts, practicing, even rehearsing with colleagues in the same room. What? Then along came England's second lockdown, when all those carefully made plans came tumbling down. Learn the Ravel Sonata. Just kidding, you can put that in the bin. Practice your scales. Just kidding, go back to bed. I was actually practicing when the news notification flashed up on my phone, saying, Boris Johnson to hold press conference this evening to announce new lockdown. In mid-practice, I actually thought, do I need to keep practicing? Maybe I can start drinking now. I'm sure I'm not the only one who finds it difficult to keep practicing when there isn't a goal in sight, whether it's a performance, a recording, or a lesson. What's been important for me to remember is that while things are postponed at the moment, we will perform again. For example, my concert for which I was practicing will now be in December, fingers crossed. <laughs> Other opportunities might come up during this lockdown, whether it be a remote recording, a piece you were meant to perform and now you actually have time to practice it adequately. We will play again and those goals, while we might not be able to see them at the moment, are there. Lurking behind the fog. Today I'm feeling optimistic. Ask me again tomorrow and it might be a completely different story. But I'm holding on to the fact that when the fog lifts and we're able to start performances again, will be so ready. And just think about how good it's going to feel to play in a performance you've been waiting so long for and for which you're properly prepared. Like drinking a whole lot of water when you've been parched for eight months. Well, you'd be dead after eight months, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I can't wait to be musically hydrated again is what I'm trying to say. My guest today is violinist Violetta Vecchi. That's a lot of Vs. As well as the violin, she plays the viola and the cello viola. What on earth is that? You'll find out shortly. Violetta and I shared a lovely chat in my garden in late October, when that was still allowed. You'll hear plenty of ambient noises, such as birds chirping and planes flying overhead. Which is fitting, because Violetta talks about her experiences performing live streams in nature. In a world where we can't necessarily interact with people in performances, Violetta interacts with the trees, water, air, the scenic backdrop as she makes her music, and tells us about the challenges that come with that. I'm also a lot more enlightened about motorbikes, having chatted to her, so do listen on. Here's Violetta. <laughs> So is he also a musician, your husband? Yeah, double bass. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. How about your other half? What does he do? Is he is he affiliated with your live streams? Yes. Yes. That's he right. is, but he's not a musician. Although we we've never played that much music together uh -huh. before. So we, we we do. He plays saxophone and guitar. We just jam a yeah. lot at home. Like we did a lot and sing a lot of songs together. Nice. This kind of thing. So it's not classical guitar. Yeah. And it's yeah. jazz saxophone and so on. Just making music for fun. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> and that, I was like, my, my, both my exes were musicians and we never played together. Right. And yeah. he's not. So he does it for fun. So yeah. when I'm too tired because I've been doing music all day, I pick up the guitar and sing a few songs and I'm like, Oh. And then I start singing. Like, it's actually quite. It's really nice because it's different. It's a reminder of why you, why you love music, isn't it? Yeah. I think we've had a few reminders of that during the pandemic oh, yeah. because obviously the work element is being taken away. But then you have to think, well, why did I decide to pursue this as work in the first place? Yeah, and you're like, I wouldn't want to do anything else. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm, yeah. This is going to work. We're going to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're um, still here, aren't we? So. That's always a good sign. Violetta, welcome to the podcast. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. We are recording this al fresco in late October yep. under the new Tier 2 lockdown restrictions, which means we can't actually meet indoors, but we can meet outside, so we're perfectly legal, <laughs> which is brilliant. Thank you so much again for joining me here today. So 
How's your pandemic been? You told me a little bit before about how you've been jamming with your non-musician other half. What else have you been doing to keep yourself busy? Well, in a way, I didn't get that calm moment where everything just stood still and I didn't know what I was going to do next. A few strange weeks at the beginning yeah. where things were like in a heightened state going, is the world changing? Yeah. Is everything I've known going to disappear? I quite soon realised that it was not going to be back to how it was. Yeah. And so part of me was like, do I need to jump on the bandwagon and start doing live streams like everybody straight away indoors and and do that? Or do I need to start doing recordings from home. My brain was just going for a few days going, what do I need to do? Mm. But what is worth doing that isn't just because of the pandemic? Yeah. You know, what is worth doing that I actually enjoy doing that's part that will help my career yeah. as well. But not even just if we're not in the pandemic, something that you can continue to do. Exactly. As well. Yeah. It was trying to find something that had a worth by itself and not just because of the pandemic. Yeah. But also how am I gonna survive? Like it was a money thing. <laughs> it was like what's gonna happen? All my gigs have been cancelled. Yeah. You know, a 30-day tour that was really hoping to get that money yeah. to get me through things because when I'm in London, I earn a decent living, but then when I'm on tour, I get some nice money coming in that helps bumper up the rest of the yeah. year. And so, of course, when suddenly the tours go away, <laughs> you're like, ah, the tours. Yeah, because I felt this as well. I had some nice trips planned. And then the stuff that you do earn during lockdown is just to keep you afloat isn't yeah. it anything else on top of that is a bonus if you can get it but then it makes you realize like oh my gosh we were so busy beforehand yes like, so before the pandemic I met you actually only just shortly <laughs> it before, was just before yes. just before the lockdown <laughs> and as you mentioned before I'm sure we would have caught up many times this year <laughs> but ah uh, alas so we met at a recording session and I know you've worked with a lot of well-known artists my sister would be very excited oh. to hear that you've worked with Tom York and Johnny okay. Greenwood because <laughs> she's a huge Radiohead fan yes yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was actually quite amazing that was with the London Contemporary Orchestra yes. unfortunately I didn't do the album mm -hmm. with Radiohead but I got to do the Tom York album, the last one. Oh, wow. And yeah. um, today's Modern Boxes. And so I got to do that recording session. Wow. And seeing Tom York just sitting a few seats away in the canteen yeah. at Air Studios was just quite... Quite surreal, quite I imagine. Quite surreal. And it was really cool how, how down to earth he was talking to everybody and making sure that we're understanding the music and mm. why and... Yeah, just, just another person. Every time yeah. you meet people that are famous, yeah. you think... They're just, they are just, they're just person. another person. They're just, and they've gone through so much. I mean, he's gone through so much, him yeah. personally, that you think, wow, these things don't stop it. Yeah. At anyone. It was really inspiring. Yeah. And then also being on stage with Johnny Greenwood doing a live score. It was a, a film score oh, live okay. at the Royal Festival Hall, uh -huh. I think it was. And he was playing in the orchestra with us. Oh, wow. He, he plays the viola, is that right? I think he does. Yeah, but he, he wasn't I mean, playing he, the viola. He plays a so. lot of things. <laughs> I definitely didn't play the viola in Radiohead. But <laughs> this is knowledge that I've gained through osmosis from my sister, who's a huge Radiohead fan, mm -hmm. that he plays viola very proficiently. Might be wrong. Not sure. He but, plays yeah. quite a few instruments. Yeah. And he's really talented. Very humble person as well. Yeah. So before that, I had a bit of a crush on him, oh. you know? <laughs> like, then I met him in person and thought, okay, he's just another person. Yeah, just another person. <laughs> but a really lovely one and yeah, really yeah. creative. And it makes you think that like these people get so far in their musical careers from being mm -hmm. lovely people, Yeah, you know? I mean, I think being a, a diva or being like hard to work with can only get you so far, right? Yeah, you I know? think so. Definitely makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, totally. So going from sharing the stage with Radiohead's greatest to <laughs> lockdown, so... <laughs> As a freelancer, you're always worried that the next gig is not going to come, <laughs> that you're going to be suddenly not busy, but you're actually very busy the whole time. Yeah. And the worry is almost unreasonable until lockdown arrives. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> nothing can prepare you for a pandemic, right? No. So you just think, oh no, I might have a quiet January. Oh no, but that happens every year. <laughs> Let alone, oh, I might have a really quiet 2020. <laughs> yes. And so, but the good news is that as freelancers, as people that constantly need to adapt, we're also quick at adapting to a pandemic, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I think that was what I felt is like, I didn't feel that, oh, I have nothing to do, but 
I suddenly started rethinking. I started buying gear. So I started <laughs> buying my, what, not too much, but just what microphones do I need to make a home studio work? Yeah. And straight away offered, you know, things. Talked to a lot of composers I knew mm. and people I knew, and said I'm available to do string recordings. Yeah. And straight away I got work. That's brilliant. So I kept myself busy doing recordings from home also being flexible with being able to play violin and viola <laughs> and then something that you probably wouldn't be very happy to hear uh-huh oh gone oh, oh i've got a cello viola what's a what <laughs> i've got a viola with octave strings on that sounds like a cello no not quite like a cello nothing can replace sure. a cello yeah, yeah, yeah. of course but the sound is the same octave okay and so it just it's not the projection isn't as strong so you'd never be able to play it in concert in the same way it has a really special sound but on some sessions where i'd be just layering different sounds and also for my own compositions mm. it's been an inspiration i love that that's incredible <laughs> I'm, I'm more intrigued rather than offended yeah. but- <laughs> So you play it like a viola, yes. but the strings are an octave lower than a viola. It's yes. the so same as the cello. Are they not really like wobbly and floppy? No, because they're made for the viola. So they're, <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're quite, they're, they're thick. Okay. They're, they're probably as thick as the cello strings. So oh, wow. they're quite hard to play for me. I'm yeah. like, oh no. You must feel like, oh gosh, this is a really, really thick string. I, I, I definitely don't envy you. And I definitely <laughs> realize that I cannot play it for a very long time or yeah. for anything challenging. Mm-hmm. But for some from drones and even like slow melodies, it's, yeah, it's just so beautiful to have that experience to play almost a cello mm. and not always have the high pitched violin in my ear. Yeah, of course. So as soon as I started playing the viola, which was only a few years ago, and then I just fell in love with it. Yeah. Now I love my cello viola, yeah. which of course, as I say, it's just for composing and for playing at home and just figuring out different parts mm. because then I have the whole range of yeah, strings of course because then with. yeah you have all the registers at yeah. your fingertips exactly. basically and in a way that you can play because uh, I assume you play it like a viola not like mm-hmm. a cello yeah and you can play it with the technique that's yes. familiar to you and so that way you're just transferring from one instrument to another and it's just been so useful throughout lockdown which I unfortunately didn't get it at the beginning of lockdown because all the strings were sold out Okay. So I had to wait for three months to get that particular... <laughs> All those really thick viola yes. cello strings in demand. <laughs> but I, I ended up restringing my vi- another violin I have with octave strings. That's a bit more common. Oh gosh, and wow. so I did that and then had to work with scordatura by detuning the G string to try to make it into a C string. That just didn't quite work. A bit it was floppy? Yeah, it was yeah. very floppy. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was editing note by note to get it. Oh goodness, to work yeah. but it was just to try to find a way to make things work yeah. to be able to offer something a bit more special mm-hmm. and to stand out within that yeah. because you know we were all at oh at the mercy of a pandemic yeah, not absolutely. knowing when things are gonna come back to normal and um there were sessions i did with another cellist yeah. somewhere else cellist was recorded but this was just okay we want just a couple more layers somewhere yeah, yeah and then you can just do it really really quickly and and as you said it does make you stand out because you were the only person i know with a uh, viola cello so <laughs> there you go <laughs> that's absolutely amazing and i imagine the sound because it's the same octave, but within the confines of the shape of a viola, yes. it's going to have a different Yes, timbre, it's something else. It? It's a different instrument, it's a different so instrument. it's complementary yeah. to a cello. Because it's not to replace. No, it definitely doesn't yeah. replace. That's why I looked at you and went, it's not a replacement. <laughs> I'm not out of a job yet. <laughs> no. I have to say, writing my last, latest album, I disappeared to the Swiss Italian Alps. I disappeared to in the house with just a wood burner. There was no central heating to get inspired and write an album about that place that meant so much to me because it's in the middle of the mountains really high up and every year I've been going there and I'd seen the glaciers disappear year by year so I was trying to also raise awareness of that in the area and all the sounds of the valley so I just was so inspired by recording all the different sounds of the valley with a field recorder and then that's why I'm mentioning it now because I took my cello viola and my violin with me yeah those two instruments on my back <laughs> and microphones and my setup and it was just a really heavy suitcase never had such a heavy suitcase in my life yeah but i managed to get it through it's and probably uh, not as bad as carrying a cello throughout all uh, that like it's probably yeah, you, see, you say that you're right yeah <laughs> i'm sorry i shouldn't even say anything i shouldn't complain in front of a chalice about weight 
<laughs> well, I mean, I should never complain about any of that stuff because I am married to a double bass player. So <laughs> That's true. You're never going to make anyone happy, really. <laughs> Perspective. <laughs> so is that where you're from? Is that the yes. area? So, okay. Yeah, I'm from, I'm half Swiss. I have Spanish and in those Swiss Alps I've just spent a lot of my summers and with family and when you just disappear from yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the city. But yeah, that particular instrument just inspired. I played it more than the violin even. Wow. It was so inspirational to write with it. Oh, wow. So that's it's just something. And no better time than the present to really explore. So yeah. I think if you were trying to explore this new instrument under the previous climate where you're busy and on no tours time. no time at <laughs> no all time, no time. so in a way <laughs> silver lining right oh, I have to say I was like I said I wasn't feeling at all like I had nothing to do it was yeah. it's good to be busy yeah isn't it yeah <laughs> so that leads me to talk about what has been keeping oh, yeah. you busy so a prominent project that's been keeping you busy over the last few months have been your live streams in nature here we are in nature and Croydon. <laughs> um, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful garden. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's very lush because we've yes. had a lot of rain, so the lawn's looking quite healthy. Yeah, and, and you've had lockdown to look after the plants. Yeah, a lot of time to uh, <laughs> tend to my tomatoes, and and uh, we're joined here by my jalapeno plant, which is bearing some fruit at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, your live streams in nature. Yes. And live streaming is something that's quickly become the new norm this year, but of course, there's no shortage of people's performances from, say, their living rooms or their backyards, maybe. But what made you decide to do it outdoors against beautiful scenic backdrops? <laughs> Mainly, the reason was nothing can replace a real life performance. Mm, of course. Really, nothing can replace that. And so, how do you do a live stream that is an experience in itself? Mm-hmm. How do you do something that will stand? through it and be something different that can't replace a live concert so I was quite reluctant to just go and play in my studio and do a concert there because the experience is not quite the same you're not elevated onto a stage you're not connecting with the audience you have no energy to bounce off yeah exactly I mean part of the spark of a live performance is the atmosphere that you're creating so much yeah of course it's something nice to connect to fans with I think I don't there's any live streams that are happening because Mm -hmm. I think People want to see that connection with your, with the musician you you like. It gets people closer almost to mm. that artist. Yes, because it's really showcasing someone's vulnerability, isn't it? You know, you're just yes. <laughs> you're doing, say, a, an Instagram live from your front room or something, and things sometimes go wrong. But you're seeing inside this person's house, and like you mentioned before, it does drive home the fact that these people are just normal people yes humans <laughs> and then on the other hand you want to keep that mystery alive as well mm-hmm. you want to have that I don't know that that feeling of creating something special of elevating people's experience from normal life and so as artists as musicians it's kind of our duty to transport people to a different world to be able to just let your feelings flow let your thoughts your emotions just merge into one and have an experience that elevates you and that changes you a lot of the time as well and it's just and can be so helpful I mean people with mental health are so 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 drawn to music because Mm. music is so music heals (laughs) yeah absolutely it helps you have an emotional reaction to a piece of art yes which is very necessary especially in these times when it's easy to get emotional by what's happening in the news and yes and it's easy to, to, to end up just having I don't know, just... Sorry, let's wait for that plane to go past. (laughs) Well, yeah, this is nature, isn't it? (laughs) So, live streams in nature are basically a way for me to... It may sound a bit silly, but it's connecting with nature. So, bouncing off the energy of trees, especially, was something I felt during the performance. Mm. So, being surrounded by living beings is very important. Of course, I also played on a beach where there's just the sea, but just the sea. I mean, it's such a force of nature. Yeah, absolutely. Everything is, it's the force, it's the elements, and as I said, especially the trees. When you play, you just feel happy after the performance. Of course, you have the people missing, but it doesn't really lack in the energy you create Mm -hmm. in the performance. And so the music I was playing in the live streams was, it's music that I wrote together with a producer a couple of years ago and that became my album, mm. which is also something that I still almost struggle to say because 
I'm a classically trained violinist. Right, yeah. And to go and, and write something that, say, isn't at the same technical level as Mozart or Shostakovich sure. or any of those composers that you look up to is quite challenging. Yeah, I, I suppose it's different coming from a classical point of view, isn't it? Because uh, well, I had another podcast guest say this a few months ago, mm-hmm. but a lot of the time we're not always doing something under our own name. Yes. So quite often your name is tied to an ensemble, an orchestra, or mm-hmm. a particular composer whose music you are exploring. But it can make you feel quite exposed when it's your own thing. Yes, and because you, you know that a lot of your musician friends are going to look at it with their musician eyes in a critical way, Mm -hmm. the same way you'd look at it. And then I think lockdown has really helped to get rid of that feeling that I may not be doing something that everybody will like. And I almost, I don't care anymore. It's like I found my voice and I found a voice that I still, I can still play Mozart string quartets and practice Bach, which I do almost every morning if I can do yeah. a little bit of Bach I'll do a little bit of Bach nice. <laughs> I'll make me happy and when I haven't done it for a week I feel sad yeah and I'll realize sure. why suddenly yeah, yeah. I'm like I haven't been playing my instrument enough it's very important to have that contact time with your instrument yes. I don't know if you saw in the living room before but I now just keep my instrument out because it just helps me actually play the mm-hmm. damn thing because yes. if it's away in its case somehow that is a huge hurdle for me to actually practice but like before you came if I just sit down, just do a few exercises, just play through a few things, you just feel better and you feel more in shape. Yeah. But going back to what you said before yes. about your album and yes. everything, and I think it's easy to be scared of the criticism drawn from perhaps your peers and stuff. But it's really worth remembering that there's space for everyone, especially now because we all have to do things like this. And you find your own voice and you want to do it, then you should just do it. And, yes, yeah. exactly. And these kind of concerts, that music, it's ambient, um, cinematic, and quite slow, quite slow moving. There's not many harmonic changes. It's mm. more about the layers. And I do it live with the, with the pedals. Oh, nice. So I'll be looping the violin a few times, add an octave pedal. In the studio, I would have had cello viola or a cellist <laughs> play or a double bass that I actually played on the album. I played oh, wow. a double bass drone myself. How was that, that was, holding the bow? Oh, wow, that was difficult. That was challenging. <laughs> yeah, you were complaining about the strings before, but yeah, double bass bow. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, layering all these things and then triggering things I've already recorded and triggering samples and some electronics. And then doing that live, so to speak, that album live, is also a challenge in itself. Yeah, the logistics. It's I was something that I, I never thought I would do or be yeah. able to and never had enough time to really work on it. Yeah. And suddenly... There was that. Yeah. Lockdown happened and there was no other gigs for other people. And it was just me. Mm. And I realized, okay, focus on you as an artist. Yeah. And like drive everything for that because you're doing something different. That, as you say, there's space for everybody and everyone's voice. Yeah. As long as you believe in it and you really, you stand behind it. Yeah. And you, you have the time for it. And you feel like you've done a good job. So any criticism that may come your way, it doesn't matter. Because at least you believe what you want to do. Exactly. And then doing that, obviously those concerts live, they don't work from a bedroom. Because <laughs> when I did the launch, I had visuals behind me. So I was like, how do I also create visuals? Yeah. Nature. Yeah, there and, you go. And my partner, Dan, he, he sat down with me and he was like, right. Let's do a vision board. Let's do some quick thinking of of what we could do, what the best ideas are. And we just went into a really creative mode to figure out what is the best way and how can we do it. And we came out with, okay, we're going to do a few of those live streams of my album in nature by really scouting the right location for the right mood. Mm. So I put pieces together that had a similar mood and went, this fits into this location or this type of location. We had mood boards full of pictures, everything, just to make it fit and say, this is a topic for this week's live stream. This is the next one. This is the next one. And we planned them out. And it started just with my album. And now it's evolved into playing arrangements of different pieces and different people's music as well. So you can program the music depending on the location. Yes, so I'm doing that as a combination. And exploring the relationship between the location, nature and music. Very important to have the three things really working and not just randomly, oh, I'm going to play that piece because I feel like it. It's (laughs) like, no, it fits in that. In the context. Into the context, into that scenery. And they both work together. Yeah. And then, of course, yeah, as you were saying before, technicalities of 
nature yeah. coming to play. Exactly. So, I mean, you coming here today and we were thinking, well, I mean, it rained all day yesterday and I just thought, oh, this is not looking good. And it even rained a little bit this morning. But I can feel the sun on my back and it's a gamble that has clearly paid off. But, yeah, I mean, how did you feel gambling with the weather? You've got, like, all your gear, quite yes. expensive equipment, mm-hmm. expensive instruments. Yeah. And sometimes playing in rather precarious locations, like, for example, on the edge of a lake or something. <laughs> You know, how did you fare with those sorts of environments where you wouldn't conventionally play? I, I laughed a lot thinking I would never have thought that I'd ever play on this kind of stage. But here we are. I mean, there were some times that were, there were some fails. There was yeah. one at the very early on. The second live stream we had planned was an epic fail. And it was so, so, so stressful because we'd planned it and we had scouted the location, made sure it was the connectivity worked, everything was fine, the light was right. And then we got there and there wasn't enough signal to do a live stream. Yeah, of course. So how do you deal with internet connectivity when you're out? Do you tether to a device or something? There's quite a few different things you can do, like yeah. technically to make it work with like cellular bonding, different ways of actually <laughs> getting to, <laughs> to have enough signal in places that there aren't. But it's not, you have to figure it out and every yeah. place is different. Yeah, of course. And yeah. so even when you go and scout a location, which is what we did and got, went back and then did it, and it didn't work. It and you had to see my day. boyfriend climbing a tree. <laughs> climbing a tree, trying to get enough signal, and it just wouldn't happen. Yeah. And there was too many too many leaves. So I'm telling you, doing a live stream in a forest is probably the trickiest thing because trees block out Wi-Fi. In a way, it's good because before that, I was like, I hate that there's Wi-Fi everywhere. Sure. Yeah. And now I'm like, I hope there's enough Wi-Fi yeah. since I started doing the live streams in nature. And then I thought, well, I don't actually like that fact. And so... We did 10 episodes of fully live live streams. And as I said, that particular episode, we had to cancel and mm-hmm. people were waiting. Right. And uh, they were waiting there, pressing, thinking it's not working. And I felt really stressed and I was letting people down because it's also like trying to get all the sound working, being my own sound engineer <laughs> to see how I'm actually sounding at the other end. Yeah. And then at the same time getting the connectivity working, then making sure that the programs work, the softworks work of the live streams and then even if you've perfectly prepared everything in your studio as soon as you open the laptop on site settings have changed yeah things crash and Mm. you don't know why because you've not studied it for your whole life because you're not the sound engineer there's a lot of margin for error and we had to work with it and we i got much better at it by the end of course you know what things to expect yes and you understand it more as well and this thing was just well you have to make sure you test everything you test it yeah so much in order to say okay i can do it Mm -hmm. and and there was other locations where suddenly it wouldn't work because suddenly there were too many people around oh really and people absorb wi-fi as well Really? Yes, with oh. blocks. So when there's too many people or also too many phones in the area, yeah, it can okay. block signal. Yep. So it's like you need to go somewhere <laughs> remote enough, but not too remote where you can actually still get signal. Yes. It's a fine balance. <laughs> it's a fine balance. Oh, I was presenting some live stream concerts over the summer, mm-hmm. the festival, and for the last concert, I think, the guy who was running the festival, his yeah. computer decided to install updates 29 minutes before the concert was meant to start. Yeah, And, you know, that blue screen of doom. Installing updates. Please do not press power. <laughs> it was very stressful. But these things happen and you don't know why and they're just out of your control and you have to find a way just to make them work. Yeah, I did a festival that was over a live stream as well and I went to a location I'd already used in the past. Mm. And that's when there were too many people because it was a different time of day. Oh, sure. And there's too many people, so all I could do was... Thankfully, I ride a motorbike. So we both, my boyfriend and I both, jumped on the motorbike and and legged it home and ended up having to do that as a backup in the back garden. Oh, wow. That okay. one was the only one. It wasn't part of my live stream series, but it was a festival. Yeah. And I had planned it and it was a specific time and I wanted to use a location I'd already used before. And then I got there and nothing. Couldn't get it to work. Yeah. So we just had to ride home and go... Set it up all up again. Yep. People had to stall my performance for a little bit longer going, she's going to appear soon. I was just thinking, how am I going to do this? Yeah. And it, it worked. It worked in the end and you make it work. And as I say, when it was cancelled, we postponed it to the week after and yep. then people were there. Yeah. 
and then in a way, you know, people are prepared. And they understood that. I yeah. think people give you that. It is a new world. There's that benefit of the doubt. Are going wrong. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I've, as, as I was telling you before, I've definitely had interview fails over Zoom, you know, mm-hmm. and the c- connectivity drops, even though it, it's just in my living room. I'm not trying to do this outside or anything. Yes. <laughs> but a Zoom call will just drop. And then I'll have to call this person back. And most of the time they understand. Because mm. this is the world we're living in now. So you hope that people are empathetic. I think they, in that and way. everybody, all the fans that were then waiting, they, they understood yeah. and they wrote to me saying, You're worth waiting for, Aww. and things like that. And I go, Oh, it makes me happy. It's yeah. like talking to the audience after your concert. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. get those comments at least on Facebook. Yeah. And, um, it's still that connection. They're yes, there is that there. connection. Yeah. And it's, it's nice, it's different. Yeah, totally. So tell me about your favorite place that you Ooh. gave a live stream performance. There's two favourite places. Yeah. So one was the Isle of Wight oh, on nice. the beach with a sunset behind. Oh. It was just too good to be true. And what month was that? Was that during the summer? Yes, that was in July. Nice. And it was so beautiful. I mean, the, the actual live stream was really beautiful. And then, you know, the pieces I'd planned were finished. My boyfriend was saying more, more, one more. And I thought he was just being funny and like kind of encouraging me. And he actually said, no, no, play one more. And then when I stopped, he was like, just carry on. It's even more beautiful now than it was before. Oh, it's going really red and beautiful. You've got to continue. Yeah. So then I connected everything up again and did an encore. Mm. But it took about 10 minutes to actually get it to work. Really? Because... So much goes behind the preparation of it. Yes. You can't just spontaneously start it again because yeah. all the settings, there's so much to think of. And then obviously the pieces. I had planned those, say, three or four pieces and they were kind of seemingly running into each other on my program because I use Ableton. Mm-hmm. And so I have to program it in advance for the set. And so if you then suddenly throw in another piece (laughs) you have to activate all the clips you have to make sure they're coming in the right time you have to make sure that the right levels there's so much to do that usually in a concert the sound engineer will take care of and you can just prepare your instrument and then go and be ready for the concert but But no no. (laughs) you have to do everything i have to do everything (laughs) and so it was good that we did it because now i have it and when once the live stream's over you can trim the beginning off and it's there and it works as Mm. a video that was stressful, but in a way, it was my favorite because just that place is just so stunning. So special, yeah. It's really special. And I guess also like having gone through quite sort of traumatic experience, <laughs> having to deal with all the technology just makes it easier for when you're just in your studio yeah. doing it in a dedicated time. Of course. And when I'm going to be playing on a stage, yeah, I'll be feeling so relaxed. Yeah, you'll be like, oh, someone else has got this. I just need to turn up and play my instrument. Yes, <laughs> but I'll be missing nature. I don't think I'm going to stop this. So I really enjoy playing yeah. nature. The last one I did of those fully live live streams was in the Alps, oh, where everything wow. started. It's in that place I went to then record my new album. Okay, yeah. And that's a place where I did it in front of mountains and a little mountain lake. They're both very different, but they both have water. Mm-hmm. And they both are just absolutely stunning. Yeah. And that's why they're my favorite. And that one was very relaxed. Yeah, It worked. Oh, no, see, I wasn't relaxed. You see, I had to. It didn't work the first time round. And I had to go back and do it the next day. Right. I knew there was a, a haggle okay. there. I yeah. knew that there was so something. It, it's never it's never easy. It's I never think easy. I think that is the lesson from all of us. <laughs> it's never easy, but you can make it work. Yeah. And um, and that's why we decided that now the next series of live streams mm-hmm. are live concerts in nature. Okay. So they're live music in nature, but they're not fully live. So we plan a day to record them. Oh, okay. Pre-recorded. It's pre-recorded, yeah. but the performances are live. It makes it much easier for the planning of it to make sure that when someone gets there at the time when I say it's 5 p.m., yeah. I will go live at 5 p.m. Yeah. No one has to wait. That's the thing that made me most yeah. stressed. And now we film it with a bigger camera. We have a... Oh, wow. You know, I've got You're a, expanding your gear. Yes. Oh, this is what happens. <laughs> it's not me on my own. That's the videographer, Ben yeah. K. Adams. He got in touch with me. When he saw the other live streams and said, I really like those live streams. I'd like to collaborate with you. Oh, nice. And so I said, you're most welcome. Oh. And uh, we started doing them together. Yeah. So now it's a film with three cameras, close up. We're still trying to do the same aesthetic of kind of disappearing into the landscape. So it's not yeah. about me playing in front of a cliff. Or you're part of it, the nature. I want to be part of it. Yeah. That is very important because, sorry to say, there's so many videos out there 
of musicians playing in nature. Yeah. First of all, it's never live. Mm. It's always music videos. It's not even a live performance. No, it's music videos playing uh, quite yeah. cheesily in front of mountain lakes and forests and whatever they do, but it's never authentic. I think what springs to mind for me, Lindsay Sterling. <laughs> Lindsay Sterling, definitely, yeah, yeah, is, is yeah, one yeah. of them. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's well, that's just a different beast completely, isn't it? So, <laughs> so I think we know you're, what you're not trying to exactly, do. Exactly, yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. exactly not what I'm not trying to do with these live streams. Yeah. It was about integration in nature with the music. It's really nice to hear your insights on that, and <laughs> I think a lot of people will relate to your struggles with it as well. <laughs> yes. Because I think it's important to talk about those things. <laughs> So you may or may not know in my podcast, I have a segment called the wildcard question round. Mm -hmm. So this is your opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on three topics that I present you. Okay. The topics we have are motorbikes, what's in your case, and favorite non-musical pursuits. I think I'm going to go with motorbikes. Brilliant. I thought you might because <laughs> <laughs> because you did mention that you rode your motorbike here today and you also mentioned that you sold a motorbike and you have mentioned motorbikes a few times. So, <laughs> so tell me about your passion for motorbikes then. <laughs> yeah, you'd probably think it's quite strange to the violinist. No, no, I love it. Uh, I think it's <laughs> motorbikes. <laughs> I think it's always great to hear about these other pursuits that people have. Well, I think it's related to freedom. A freedom and traveling and being independent. Mm -hmm. And I think that can relate and resonate with a lot of musicians as well. Yeah. Right now, it's been fantastic throughout the pandemic because I don't yeah. have to go on public transport if I don't yeah. want to. You just jump on your bike and go. I'm not restricted in yeah. a way. If I want to go and disappear somewhere, I kind of can with the motorbike. I can yeah. just pack my things, go somewhere, and that's it. Yeah. I never thought I'd have a big motorbike. So now I've got a nice 900cc Kawasaki. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Which is a, it's a cafe racer, so it's, it's, it looks really cool. Yeah. And I finally have a bike that looks really cool. You looked really cool when you came today. You had your, you had your leather jacket on. You had your helmet. So badass. It's, it's, it's great. And, uh, and uh, it's, it, it goes fast. So I really like yeah. going fast. It's just the adrenaline. I've always enjoyed that. And um, I think you build up with bikes. First, I had a scooter about five, six years ago. I got a scooter because I'd ridden one on, a, on an island in the Pacific. It was really fun. I, Which island was that? That was in Morea in uh, Micronesia. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. With my duo partner, we did a few concerts on a ship there mm -hmm. that went around those islands. And I have to say that was fantastic Beautiful. experience because yeah. we even had a butler on board looking <laughs> after us it was, it was probably the most incredible <laughs> yeah. you know luxurious ship I'd ever been on and I wouldn't have chosen it as a holiday place but as work mm -hmm. it was pretty impressive it was you um anyway the motorbike so I hired a little scooter on that island and enjoyed it so much I thought I'm going to do this in London yeah and then had a scooter for a few years then upgraded to a manual bike thinking it's boring it's not boring I just have to turn it on and that's it I want to do some what I want the challenge and then I didn't want to have an L plate on my bike because yeah. that looks a bit silly and like you don't know what you're doing so I said I need to get the full motorbike license but I'll never get a big bike no, no, I'm fine with the one I have. Hmm. <laughs> of course, as soon as you do the test on that bigger bike, you go, what was I thinking? It's so yeah. much more fun. Yeah. It's more safe as well. It feels like a contradiction, but a bigger bike is safer because there's more grip on the road. It, you're more visible. Yep. And you have enough power to be more maneuverable. So you have the speed to get out of tricky situations. Of course, you've got the speed to then go faster on the motorway and on roads yeah. so that's not safe in a way but if you wear proper gear protection yeah. i even have an airbag so i've got an airbag wow. that that will inflate hopefully <laughs> if i ever wear to crash and yeah. then i'll be a little bubble bumping along the road but that does make sense though because it's like what they say with cooking with knives it's much safer to use a sharp knife than mm -hmm. a dull knife and then you think what but a dull knife is not going to cut you but it's more dangerous because you're more likely to slip and still cut yourself and yes. have accidents. Yes. Whereas a sharp knife, you have precision. 
yes. like you were saying before with maneuverability. It's exactly the same thing. And most accidents are caused by the little scooters that are delivery drivers that right, are trying sure. to go quickly because yeah. they want to get more orders in and they end up just jumping the rules, yeah. they, the traffic rules. They, they, they don't apply to them and they're the ones that are getting the statistics up. Really, when I started looking into statistics to show my mom, <laughs> right. so my mom, don't worry, she I'm safe. <laughs> reassurance. <laughs> I even reassured myself. Yeah, yeah. Going, hey, hey, this is really cool. I mean, of course, when there's an accident and there's a car and a motorbike, the motorbike will suffer more damage mm -hmm. and it can be more lethal. But those are just the sensationalized headlines. The percentage is not very big at all. Yeah, hopefully don't happen that often. No. And you've got to take no, your no. own responsibility, your own precautions to make sure that that doesn't happen. And you're always alert. It's so yeah. much fun. I feel like I'm in an action film. <laughs> so alive. Or they're like, oh my God. I feel like, oh, I need to look this side, this way. You can't just listen to podcasts. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm fine. sorry. No, On a motorbike, fine. I wouldn't recommend no, you, it. Absolutely. You've got to be alert. And that's the scary thing about driving. Yeah. I don't know if you, you drive in London, but there are times where I do switch off. Like, it's a bit weird admitting this, but sometimes if you've got a really long road trip yeah. and then you sort of realize, oh, I have no idea what happened in the last 10 minutes. Highway hypnosis. Yeah. And you just think... I should really be a lot more alert. <laughs> autopilot. You cannot go on autopilot on the bike. Even when you're going fast as well, the elements are just blowing yeah. in your face. There's times where I've been so cold on a bike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my word. One of the worst experiences of my life, I must say. Probably the, the day I was most scared of my life, about my life, right. <laughs> yeah. was on the mot motorbike, riding back from a gig. I was doing a tour with the group Steel Eye Span last year. And I had done a two-hour concert on stage, playing, singing, everything. It was really long. It was quite tiring. And that day I'd already been riding from one gig to the other because my boyfriend came along and we had three days where he joined us on the tour yeah. and we were going with the motorbikes from one concert hall to the other. Mm -hmm. And so we'd ridden about a few hours that day. And then riding back that night, well, we were going to stay in the hotel, but the weather forecast was so terrible for the next day, for the next day yeah. that we made a quick judgment call and said it's going to be safer to ride home tonight and Ooh. I'm it was about 11 p.m. and I thought I'm so tired I'm so tired yeah. I'm so drained of energy you don't realize how draining a concert is oh of course uh, yeah, for, like yeah. when you, if you're not a non-musician you think oh this is it was fun do. yeah the, the, that was a fun experience <laughs> this is what we do to relax <laughs> and no, for you it's just so draining yeah absolutely we jumped on the motorbike and went home and then unfortunately it already started raining oh, that night no. on top of everything and it was really cold and the road was really badly lit you couldn't see the cat's eyes had completely gone yeah. so sometimes you didn't even know if you're going a curve or if you're going straight it was pitch black and it was freezing my head was hurting and oh, i was just no. going I don't want to die tonight. How long did that take you to get home? Two and a half hours. Oh, man. And it was painful. But when I got home, I thought, I have done everything. I can take anything. Yeah. Like, <laughs> now I can ride. I know I can ride even in yeah. the toughest conditions. Sure. Because you can do you can more. Do, you can do anything. It's just like you dealing with all your logistics and your live streams. Yes. And then you'll go back to the studio and be like, this is easy. Exactly. <laughs> and I recommend it to anyone. Like, push your limits yeah. in anything. Yeah. And you realize what you're capable of. And you look back a year later and think, wow, look how far I've come. Yes. And it's in music. When I had to push myself to practice for an album once and I thought I could never practice more than four or five hours a day, mm -hmm. I found myself practicing eight hours a day. Oh, wow. And that's something I thought, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, as long as it's good practice during those eight hours. Of yes. Course. But yeah. that was because I had that crazy deadline I needed to record. Yeah. Isai for an album. I'm like, oh yeah. my word, I can never do this. You know, you start comparing yourself to those world-class soloists and you think, I'm not at that level. Yeah. And then you realize you can push yourself. Obviously, maybe not for that long a yeah. time. And I wouldn't recommend an eight-hour practice schedule for very yeah. long periods of time. It was just more like a short yeah. spurt. A really intense period of working. And usually because there's a deadline, which yeah. is quite... Urgent. Which is what but we, you you need those things to really push you. Otherwise, you can just float along. Oh God, yeah. I mean, that's but what yeah. is slightly missing in lockdown. I think <laughs> we've got to set our own deadlines. And that's why the live streams. I was like, I made my life quite stressful in a way, but also quite rewarding because yeah, I gave myself those deadlines to yeah. actually just do it. And once you put a deadline online, I think there's more um, pressure. <laughs> there is, it's there, and you can't take it off. And it's and this you, is coming out on Friday. It has to now because I've said it. <laughs>
I love hearing that parallel between music and motorbikes. <laughs> you heard it here first. So. <laughs> Violetta, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been so nice to catch up with you and so nice to talk to you. So where can people find out more about you and your live streams? Just head to my website, just violettavici.com. And that's Violetta with one T and two Cs. Violetta Vici. <laughs> Sounds like you've had to say that a few times before. <laughs> yes, because there's some fake profiles with two Ts and oh, I don't know. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. And uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube... Yeah, everywhere. Out there. I have to be. We yeah. all have we to all be. We all have to be. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. But also, it's quite interesting because on the different platforms, you like show different things in different formats. Yeah. And uh, it can be quite fun if you don't take it too seriously. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it, it can take a lot of your time oh, away. Yeah. yeah. Which I don't like. Mm -hmm. But at least I think myself and you and everybody here, every musician during lockdown has probably gotten better at. Yeah. social media then I hope so <laughs> and like putting out the things that are more worthwhile yes. or following the things that are more worthwhile it's the things don't just put out rubbish or things yeah. that just just for the sake of <laughs> yeah, it it's exactly. about things that at least we try at yeah. least, I think. as you mentioned before it's something that you really stand behind and something that you really believe in and, and that important. can stand the test of time in a way that actually is something that is worth doing and not just because you're now stuck in lockdown yeah. you can put up a little <laughs> video yeah, yeah. with a really bad recording sound just because you want to show that you're doing something, it's not worth it. It's lacking the quality. I feel this way if I see people post things that have got loads of typos. I just judge them straight away. As soon as I see a typo, I'm like, well, you haven't thought about that properly. <laughs> that's just me. But that's so true. It's like you need to take the time to do things properly. Yeah. And nowadays almost there's no excuse also with gear, with microphones. You don't have to spend that much money. I didn't spend that yeah. much money and to you get can, those live streams going. And you can get a decent result from that. Totally. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much thank once you. again. <laughs> thank you for having me. That was my chat with Violetta. It was great to have a face-to-face -face chat with her. Later, we hung out in the garden. I gave her the last apple from my apple tree, which she ate with a very puckered face. I believe it was rather tart. She also met assistant producer Romeo, who's not met many of my podcast guests, and Violetta remarked, He's so beautiful. How do you get any work done? I ask myself that every day. Though he mostly prevents me from doing work by sitting on my keyboard. This is where my ass goes. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from bassoonist Christina Moroni, who's had to deal with all sorts, on stage or in the pit. Music College Didn't Prepare Me for when I had to empty confetti out of my bassoon at the interval of an opera because they used so much of it. It worked its way through the stage and in through the roof of the pit. And I had, I think this is a different concert, and I had to stop playing during the end of 1812 Overture because the cannons and indoor fireworks behind me malfunctioned, dear, and let off so much smoke I couldn't see or breathe, setting the fire alarm off in the auditorium and sprinkling the audience. Oh no, that's a disaster. A poor wet audience and a wind player who is unable to breathe. That's terrible. Also, I've never played the 1812 Overture in a situation where I've been completely comfortable. The first time I played it, I was sight reading on stage. Welcome to the UK, this is what we do. But then every other time, there's always so much going on. It's so loud and often you're outdoors and a bit cold, but it's so bright because of the fireworks and you're having to contend with pretty horrendous key changes. Six flats? What even is that? Most of them get cancelled out anyway. Not ideal. And speaking of confetti, my husband Mark was an extra in the film The Great Gatsby, which came out a few years ago. He was in the ballroom scene with the orchestra, and there was loads of confetti, which we were finding in our old Sydney flat for months afterwards. If you're looking for something to do, why don't you try and find Mark in The Great Gatsby? He is in there, I can confirm. I'll be it briefly. Thank you, Christina, for your contribution. Remember, if you have an experience or anecdote that you want shared or discussed on the podcast, then let me know. You can email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. 
That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Massive thanks to Violetta for being my guest this episode, for riding her motorbike all the way from north to south London to catch up for a chat in the garden, back when we could. And thank you for listening. It's always great to hear from you, so do get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com and follow and like the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. Remember to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for spreading the word. Chat to you soon and take good care. Bye.